When I was invited to this conference, I was like, um, I have no idea what multidimensional microscopy is um, and what sort of mathematics are involved in it. Um, and so I was just like, but um, number one, free trip to IPAM is always good, always learn something. And number two, um, at least one of the organizers uh, knows the kind of math I do. So obviously they know something that I don't know. But um, so the optimist view is that means this talk will be 100% controversy free because there's no microscopy in it. So there's no microscopy related issues to debate. Okay, so then I looked on the website and the, we had this, this beautiful picture, um, which, uh, you know, I start seeing the talks and I was very confused about this picture. Um, I, I'm guessing, guess on the, the question yesterday that this picture is due to Paul, um, but um, in any case, I was like, tensor decomposition. Okay, well, what about matrix decomposition, which is a tensor, um, just a tensor in a way that when people call them tensors, then it's usually kind of annoying because they're just trying to use a cool term like tensor, like a buzzword. Um, but speaking of buzzwords, the buzzwords of the day are unsupervised learning and interpretable AI. So we've already seen this um, in, in particular today, earlier, unsupervised learning. So can a model be learned without a large set of labeled data? And interpretable AI, can a human gain intuition behind model outputs? So this is desirable in fields like atmospheric environmental science. So this is, I in particular have collaboration um, with people in that field. And it seems like this is also something that like my cross view, you guys have a lot of, a lot of data, not necessarily labeled. Maybe you do some augmentation to make things labeled, blah, blah, blah. But in general, um, you have a lot of unlabeled data. And um, okay, so the key idea principle component analysis, and here I'm now gonna throw a bunch of complicated math up there, is the schmidt eckert mirsky young theorem that says if we have a singular value decomposition of a matrix, um, then this truncated um, decomposition is the best at, at most rank K approximation of A. So, Really what I wanna say here is um, if we have some way of stacking our data into a matrix, then we can use this truncation somehow to find the best fit um, K dimensional uh, subspace to that. But the, the thing is, is the best is actually with respect to two different mathematical ways of measuring best, which often, that, that very rarely happens, that it optimizes two different cost functions simultaneously, but in this case it does. Okay, so slide one, um, PCA doesn't hurt to try. Uh, so this was from back when I was uh, in my first postdoc at NIH and I was working collaboration with the National Eye Institute. Oh, and first of all, um, we mathematicians were big into the humble brag. So we just put our last an, uh, initial whenever we're citing anything with our name. So it's like, oh, we're humble, but it's really just to bring your attention to the fact that it's our name. So that's, that's what K means on my slides. Um, right, so we were working, um, we were working collaborating with the National Eye Institute and our goal was to do some things quantifying uh, macular pigment in order to better understand age-related macular degeneration. Um, so what we had is we would have for each patient a stack of four so-called fundus camera images of their retina um, under uh, one wavelength and four under another. Uh, and so before we got into any of the other stuff that we ended up doing, we just did the simplest thing we could think of. We registered those four images, and then we put it into PCA. And the first principal component that we got out was a pretty nice denoised version of our images. And the third and fourth principal components look like noise. But now we look at this second principal component, and you see these little, almost looks like hoof prints in the background, and this kind of lighter region and a darker region and a couple like dead pixels. Every second principal component for all of the patients looked exactly like this. And when we showed this to um, the researchers at the National Eye Institute, the woman, who had taken thousands of these images of people of all, with all sorts of different diseases almost fell out of her chair because her neural network had picked up this, this, these phantoms that are coming from just the, the interior mechanics of the camera, even though she couldn't like put it to words and suddenly it was like seeing a ghost. So sometimes it, it, it just doesn't hurt to try. 
Um, we saw in Ivan's talk that it doesn't always work, but you know, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to start. Okay, so I've changed the order around a bit. Um, I, here's the vectorized persistent homology, and down here's the flag medians. They're both, I think, really cool projects. Um, but I've thrown in so many new slides uh, here of things that have like uh, related to discussions or people's talks from the last uh, two and a half days. And I think as cool as flag medians are, they might not be as pertinent to your data. So I've thrown it here in the end. So if I run out of time, I'm rushing through maybe things that are less interesting. But if you find them interesting, just talk to me in the coffee break. OK, so here is the, the problem that we were working on. Um, there, it's about the mesoscale organization of clouds. So we have sugar, flour, fish, and gravel. Um, and understanding when uh, clouds have these different types of for, uh, mesoscale organization can help with prediction of storms and whatnot. Um, right, so again, in atmospheric science is a case where you have lots and lots of images of clouds and not a whole lot of labeled data. Um, and so what we decided to use is we tried to use topological data analysis. So I'm going to teach you Topological data analysis are going to first, uh, first step teach you homology in one slide. OK, so we have four different uh, spaces, shall we say. So um, we have this purple circle, our purple disk. We have a blue circle. We have two disconnected green circles. And we have two connected red circles. And to each of them, I am assigning two numbers. So anyone who, has not, who does not know the answer because they've seen homology or TDA before, does anyone want to hazard a guess? Where, what do these numbers mean? These pairs of numbers I've assigned to each of these four different shapes. Exactly right. So this is what's known as the zeroth Betty number. And it is just counting the number of connected components. So we have one chunk, one. One chunk, one. Two, two. One, one. OK, what about this next number? Number of holes, exactly right. So the first Betty number is counting the number of holes in some sense. So this thing has no holes. This thing has one, two, and two. So these four spaces all get um, two, four different pairs of numbers. And we could deform this so we could have a little um, squiggly thing. And as long as it was connected and had one hole, it would still have one and one as its two Betty numbers. And there are higher order Betty numbers that are kind of, you can think of like two dimensional voids and higher. Um, for the purposes of our main application here, um, all, these two are the only that we're going to use. OK. So the way that we're going to apply this is somehow we're going to learn Betty numbers, but over a sequence of sort of filtered images. And then we're going to look at what, what is persists um, in these sort of Betty numbers over that time. So we are going to use here what is known as super level set persistent homology. Uh, sub level set is more standard, but for the clouds didn't work as well. So it's the same idea. OK, with this very simple image here. And here we have four different slices of the things that we're sort of um, going to be analyzing. And what we're going to do, so this image is, has values between 0 and 255. And for each possible threshold, starting with 255 and going down to 0, we are going to look at the shape of all the pixels that are at least as big as that threshold. So here, for 209, that is only encoding these very, very bright pixels here in this crescent. And now, um, this is going to be real hard. I'm just going to move over here. OK, and so let me show you what we're looking at here. So the red is giving us things related to that zeroth Betty number. And the blue is giving us something relating to that first Betty number. So here at this vertical slice at 209, we have one connected chunk, and we have no holes. So we should only hit one red bar, and we do. OK, so now we lower the threshold, keep lowering, lowering. And then now let's look at our next snapshot, 151. So at this point, we've gotten bright enough are dark enough for our threshold that these two corners, the lower left and right, they're suddenly now um, bright enough to be included. And so if we look here as we have these, this, this barcode, 
We've now added in these two little red things because here the Betty number is three. And so we have three red chunks in that part. But you notice it's not gonna be too much longer when we change that threshold till these corner chunks are merged in with our thing. So that's why these bars, these little red bars are very, very short because soon they're gonna be just merged into the big glob. Okay, now we look at the cutoff of 94. And at this point now, um, we have almost all the image, but except for this little annulus here and this little ring here. So we look at this point here and we have two connected pieces. We have the white piece on the outside and we have the inside. And then we, we finally have this blue piece here because we have a hole. So inside this white region, there is a hole. And so that's why we're hitting this blue bar. And as we keep going and going and going, weird things happen. So this is like, there's like some invisible tiny blue bars that pop up and some teeny tiny red bars that are like, meaning this little piece and this little piece, yes. Quick question for understanding, like how do you count holes that are inside holes? So if like the inner structure had another hole inside of it, does this inner hole count towards? Yeah, so if there was like another nested, like let's say there's another like black stripe here, then you would have two. Uh, yes, it's two holes, but... Um, okay, so it doesn't matter whether the holes are sort of disconnected or inserted in... Yeah, so this is like what we had here. The disconnected holes and the connected holes, for the purposes of counting holes, are the same. In fact, if I took the surface of um, a donut, then that would have for the, this B1, it would also have two. Because you could kind of think of it's like the inside of the donut, that ring, and then the out, this thing going around here, those are two rings. So even though that's something that's a three-dimensional object, it's still, as far as 1D holes go, has the same 1D hole structure as these two. And then for these two, you can distinguish them by the fact that the other Betty numbers are different. And then for the the surface of the donut, then there, that's actually going to have some non-zero high order things as well because it's a three-dimensional object. Okay, any other questions? Okay, cool. So the persistent barcode, I think, is the easiest to sort of initially see um, what is being encoded here. Um, and so it's called persistence because the original sort of focus on why it was created was the idea was, oh, you have noisy data, and whatever traits persist, so this long red bar and like this medium blue bar are somehow true uh, traits of your data. Um, but now we're gonna see that some of these short bars are actually really informative, and the, the, the noise in the, the bars can actually be very informative. But we have these barcodes, and then let me explain what this persistence diagram is. So we have this thing at infinity, this red dot. This is just saying it's encoding this long red bar. It says, hey, there is already always something here. So <laughs> always something here, we're gonna say that's just infinity because no matter what we threshold, there's something there. And now we see these, what we're doing is we're plotting birth versus death. So the X coordinate of a dot is when one of these bars start and the Y coordinate is when they stop. So for example, here, this little blue chunk that comes from us having a ring is, um, it started around 160-ish, so that's around that number here, and then it dies out here around, say, 55. And so that's the point. So you can't have anything down in this lower right because that means something died before it was born. So everything is up here, and the closer you are to this diagonal line, the shorter lived that feature was. And now let me show you how we get the persistence landscape. Okay, so we take the barcode and we sort of move these bars up. So for each horizontal bar, we're gonna build a triangle. So we just move it up and then we build the right triangle, the, the isosceles right triangle that is kind of face down where the base is that bar. And we do that for all of them. We get something that looks like a mountain range. <clears throat> That's called a persistent landscape because it looks like a landscape. Okay, and now what we do is we kind of look at what are the dominant features. So 
If we are tracing our finger on the outside, we would kind of go up and down and up and down and up and down, and that's going to be our function one in this solid. And then we remove that function and we say, let's do that again. So now we're on these little dotted up and down, up and down, up and down. That's our function two. Remove those lines. Do the same thing, function three. <clears throat> so the idea is somehow this topology, this persistent homology is encoding information. But if we want to use it with almost anything, not just machine learning techniques, most math techniques, we need to have vectors. Like some list of bars, that's not very useful. Um, so one second. So how do we create vectors from this? Because if we have different spaces, they're not necessarily going to have the same amount of bars. Um, there's something you can do with persistent diagrams called persistent images that I'm not going to discuss because it wasn't good for our particular application. But what we do is we take this dominant function one and we measure it, sample it very evenly spaced. And then we take the next function and sample the values very evenly spaced, and the next one. So we have a parameter that we have to choose to turn persistent homology into a vector, which is how deep in the functions are we going and how tightly are we going to space our measurements or sampling to turn this into to vectors. Yes? Uh, I didn't quite understand what the landscape is. Is it the envelope of the three functions or is it like... Well, the landscape, well, the, the basic landscape is this thing here, but then you can kind of add depth to it. So some people have these really nice 3D pictures where you kind of take the envelope and that's the, the dominant feature. And then the next level front is the envelope after you remove the envelope. And then the next level front is the envelope after you remove the envelope. Oh, ah, OK. So this is basically like another dimension into the screen? Exactly. And you just remove these outer envelopes? And so then you decide, so it's a parameter you set, how deep, how many envelopes you want to go through when you're vectorizing. And you make that choice and apply that to all of your input. So here, if you notice, we didn't, we didn't go down like this feature doesn't show up at all. So maybe we decide that's not so important for us. Any other questions? OK. So here's what this looks like with real data. This is a sample image from the grayscale modus imagery that was used in that, that labeled data space. Um, and then now we can see real persistent barcodes are a lot messier than the ones we are looking at. Um, this is the persistent diagram, and this is the landscape. Um, and what we chose is for each of the blue and the reds, for each of them we went five envelopes deep. And then we sampled each of those at uh, like 1,000 evenly spaced points for each of those envelopes. Um, I misspoke. Fewer than that. But so we end up getting 2,000 dimensional uh, vectors. So that's 1,000 for each of the 0 and the 1 divided by 5. So 400 points from each of the envelopes that we're measuring. So here's the kind of key idea here is we did, it was completely unsupervised in that we took da data that had labels, but we didn't treat those labels. We just did the TDA, turned that into vectors, and then just did PCA. So it's 2,000 dimensions, and 90% of the variation was captured by three dimensions. And then when we did that, there was strong linear separability between the classes. So we did not include the labels at all in our, any of our pipeline. We didn't, we didn't include the labels when we were doing TDA. We didn't include the labels when we were doing PCA. But we're able to take these images, get them into three dimensions, and we have two different classes. Well, this is, uh, oh gosh, I didn't write down which class. But we still have separability of the classes. Yes? Can you repeat how you got vectors from the uh, landscapes? So for each landscape, we define a series of functions. And the, the dominant function, the first function, is the envelope. So it's the outermost lines that we get. Now we remove that function, and we say, what's the next envelope? So if we remove this solid red line, this outer line from these things, then the next um, topmost function, the envelope, is this dotted thing right here. And that's our function two. We remove that, and then we get another one. 
and we go as deep as we want, just make sure it's consistent across all of our data. Um, and then for each of those functions, we just read off what the numbers are and evenly space. So we were doing like every, we're sampling them evenly. Yeah. Yes. There's a hand. Uh, what happens if you have two disconnected regions? You change the threshold and they connect. How does that show up on the barcode? Um, so, so you're saying if it's like we've got this, da 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 da. Yeah, but spatially, like two two things that are disconnected at one threshold and then connected later. Okay. So here, <laughs> I was sweeping a lot of math under the rug. So it ends up that the way that this is computed. With these, with these things called via torus rips complexes, which I did not want to talk about. But it's just this massive two-dimensional chain of vector spaces and maps between the vector spaces. Because uh, this is a very good question. It was the first question I had when I first learned about persistent homology. And the way that these things are encoded, it is sort of measuring like, oh, here's me these points. And at this moment, they sort of squeeze together and go from one hole to two holes where at the same time this hole here squeezes to, squeezes together and the hole vanishes like that is that is under the hood with the actual algorithm how this is actually computed but yes that's not an obvious thing but it it it's ma it's voodoo magic i still don't actually completely understand it but it is part it, it is the way that it's calculated that that does keep track of things but that's a great question anything else yeah is there some intuitive Meaning to the fact that three dimensions captured most of the variance. Uh, so um, I've been talking. So this is collaboration with. I'll just point this out. This is Lana for Hope, a very amazing doctoral student of mine, Henry Adams, collaborator who is a topologist, and Emma Eppert Uphoff, who's uh, the collaborator we have in atmospheric science. And I've been talking with Henry, and I'm just like trying to figure this out because it's like obviously something of this is that there's some hidden structure. Because this literally was a, OK, we want to do TDA. And then it was literally like, PCA, let's just try it out. And then it was like shocking that it worked. I mean, like I, I remember when, when Lander had the weekly meeting and showed us the plots, we were all like, wait, what? <laughs> like, that shouldn't have worked. That was just like step one to give to the doctoral student. And then it worked. And like it was, it was just like, oh, OK, that's, that's surprising. It was kind of like the just regularizing with uh, total variation. And it worked. And you're like, oh. So I've been one thing I've been thinking about maybe for some future work on the more theoretical side is trying to understand like the like the realizability like if like there's some restrictions on what these things look like and so then you would imagine there's some restrictions on what the possible vectors are maybe some of that's already explained by the possible vectors you can get out of it I mean certainly not down to three dimensions but yeah, I, again, it's still not completely clear why that happened. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, is this example, did you try just using PCA normally and it kind of completely doesn't work? Or uh, like kernel PCA or other techniques like this? Well... I'm just trying to get intuition of like, what, what is this doing that like some of the really classical stuff... Because if you just do PCA, that's not taking into account any of the actual like geometric properties of things. So I mean, here we've got this weird thing. If, if, the, if, if the measurement we have is a slightly offset version of, you know, from the, the satellite being slightly different position, um, PCA would read those two different, uh, these two different things as being orthogonal to each other. But we want them not to be treated orthogonally because we, we want to say that they're similar with respect to their structure. Yeah? Yeah. So what were actually the classes, the yellow and the red labels? Is this like the cloud type or? Yeah, so those are two cloud types. And I, I don't know. I've completely linked on those. Just for visualization, we just have the, I just chose, there's like two classes that were chosen. But it's, let's say, sugar and fish. I, I don't remember. But the, so the labels are then put on after we do this as a visualization of the fact that they were still separated. I mean, and this obviously isn't like, perfectly, perfectly separated, but they're very well separated. This is just SVM showing this separability. So um, there, there's definitely something that I think could be a little more sophisticated that's done, but it's still just the surprising fact that vectorized PCA or vectorized to topological data analysis and then PCA gives something that's still that separable, which I think is pretty, pretty surprising.
since those, those classes had nothing to do with the entire pipeline up to that point. And we did do something that was completely unsupervised, which was we do the vectorized PC, uh, TDA and then um, the uh, PCA and then run clustering algorithms and look at different classes for that. It didn't come up with the, exactly the same classes, but like one of the next steps is like working more with the people in atmospheric science to actually see if it gave us something that was meaningful and interpretable. Cool. Any, any other questions? Cool. Okay, so um, with whatever time um, is left, uh, let's get started on other stuff. So these are all slides that I added mainly last night. Um, just based on different interactions, different people's talks, whatever, um, math things that may be of interest. Okay, quick comment on more um, ideas of this persistence or mesoscale. So Brian and I have had a few offline talks where like mesoscale features just keep coming up again and again. Um, and if we're thinking about that sub or super level set persistent homology, then you could think of mesoscale being the bars that are really long. Um, so something that's on a larger scale than noise, but on a smaller scale than like curvature or average characteristics. So I'm going to give you two different examples. Okay, so this is um, persistent homology of point clouds, which is kind of like the first type of data that persistent homology is doing. So the, the other example, we were thresholding, um, we were looking at where pixels were that were above a certain threshold. And at each of those, those thresholds, we looked at the, the homology of it. Um, so in this case, we've got some data cloud, and I want you to ignore how weird this looks. I really, <laughs> I was trying to find an example that was going to be the way I explained it, and this one's actually kind of showing a little under the hood of how this is computed. But the way you should be thinking about this is I have this data cloud. So if we're looking at this as humans, we're like, hey, that looks like a figure eight. I should get some, the true topology of this should be um, the zeroth Betty number one, because it's connected, even though this is all disconnected points, and first Betty number two, because it has two holes. So somehow I want to have features that give me those two Betty numbers, one and one, to say connected and two holes. So ignore the way this actually looks. Think about, I want you to think about it this way. For each of these dots, what we're going to do is we're going to replace each dot with a ball of epsilon radius. And for each epsilon radius, we're going to union all the balls. And then on that union of balls, we're going to look at the homology of that space. So again, this looks all pointy. And that's just showing this underlying complex that's the way it's actually computed. But the, um, so here, again, it looks weird. But the, the actual homology of this space is going to be the same as if we had those little balls that are growing up. So um, when it's really small, we're getting all these little disconnected components. And we have these little holes that are popping up due to noise. So lots of disconnected components and lots of almost could, one could almost think of like little bubbles that are forming because we've got the noise. So we're going to have, so here this is H1. So this, is a, this isn't the connected components part. This is only for the loops. But yeah, we've got all these little short bars around here that's somehow encoding the noise. Um, and then as it grows, we're eventually going to get some persistent here. These two long bars are representing the two holes that are very stable. So the mesoscale organization topologically of this data point until finally it just becomes a big blob and there's, there's no more holes. And so then the persistence diagram version of the, the hole counting, we have these two dots that are far above that x equals y line. And then a bunch of these are close that's kind of just taking this to account. OK. And the other mesoscale thing that I wanted to talk about is using PCA. Um, something called geometric multi-region evolution analysis, which unfortunately has been used by mathematicians in a lot of different ways. So this is what I mean. Um, what I mean is local PCA plus multi-scale structure. So very hand wavy, the idea is if you have data that's on a manifold, so think of the surface of the Earth or a circle or a string going through space, if you zoom in really, really close, it looks like it's linear. So if I have a piece of string that I'm wrapping around through three space, if I get really, really close, if I'm an ant on that string, 
then I think that little piece of string is just a flat little line segment. And maybe I go on YouTube and make videos about the flat string theory or something. But the point is, is that very, very close, at very, very low scale, it looks like a little flat thing. <clears throat> and little flat things are what PCA is made to be able to pick up. It's really good that we got the Eckhart Schmidt Mirsky Young theorem that says, hey, if we've got data and it's near something flat, that's the way to find how it's flat. So the idea, and I don't want to go too much into this, but it's, it's from people who are coming from a harmonic analysis background, or they, they think about things in a multi-scale structure, but it's basically you partition the points at a small scale, and at each of those levels you do local PCA. Then you partition the points at a slightly larger scale, and at each of those partition points you do local PCA. And you keep growing these things out, and with the algorithm there's kind of a smart way to connect these things up. Um, and then the idea is there's some sort of persistence of the, um, there's some sort of persistence of the significant singular values you're doing while you get the PCA. And there's sort of a linear persistence that has to do with the actual local dimensionality and a sort of quadratic one that has to do with the curvature. Yes? Um, how does this relate to like isomap? Like, so, isomap is also using this kind of fact that manifolds locally are an RN? I mean, any nonlinear dimensionality estimation technique is going to be using the fact that, leveraging the fact that a manifold is locally something that's linear. So isomap, locally linear embeddings, and a lot of these things in this particular type, their, um, their basic progress is you take your points, you build a nearest neighbor map, either by K nearest neighbors, or connecting all points within a certain epsilon ball, once you have that, then you turn it into a matrix, which what kind of matrix you turn it into is very much dependent on, is it LLE, is it isomap, is it this other thing? And then you do some sort of eigenvalue decomposition of that matrix. So number one, that is, it's a slice at one level, like you choose a K nearest neighbors and you choose an epsilon, and that is like the slice that you're doing. Whereas this is really about persistence. So kind of at each level, you're getting something different. Maybe you could try to do a persistent LLE. That, I don't know if that exists in the literature. That could be something you could do. But it is, most, most things somehow are using some sort of matrix decomposition for these nonlinear, not everything, but many of them are. Now, this, is, this has come up already in this conference. Um, well, this is going on YouTube. But uh, <laughs> the code that's associated with this is not very usable. It's a great idea. Um, it would be great if, if someone else implemented it again because it's tied into some other previous code. So it's like, I think, a little, little more bogged down than it should be. But the idea, I think, is really super cool. OK, any other questions? All right, so um, now I want to talk about something that um, I had done a while ago. And I don't think this particular method is going to be good enough for you because it's not particularly fast, but I'm going to use it to maybe inspire some other discussion. OK, so the key idea of applied harmonic analysis, by my definition, is we have some data f. We take inner products of that data f with some phi j that are, well, I would say as a mathematician, the, or the orbit of a projective unitary uh, representation or maybe the subsampling of such an orbit. Um, but the important thing is that there's some trait that's parameterized by j. And if we look at the absolute value of that inner product of f with vj, then that gives us the amount of that trait. So I don't need to tell you guys anything about Fourier. This is an audience that is very well versed in Fourier. Honestly, probably a whole lot more than me, even though my PhD is in harmonic analysis. You guys know Fourier, right? But we can think of the absolute value of the inner product of e with 2 to the pi i gamma argument, or if you want to do the modulus squared, if that makes you feel better, as the amount of the frequency in our signal. So now I'm going to do something weird. Don't worry what's going on here. Just worry that these things have three parameters, a parameter j that's scale, a parameter l that's orientation, and a parameter k that's position. And somehow when we take these inner products, the absolute value is giving us information about the amount of features at scale j, orientation l, and position k. OK, now I'm going to say, I'm going to dramatically simplify what neural networks are. 
Neural networks, the key idea is that pairing nonlinearity with the smartly chosen linear maps is very powerful. OK. So I'm going to do what could be thought of as a non-trained one-layer <laughs> neural network here. Um, but let me, let me give you the data that was the inspiration for this. Um, this is my um, former colleague at the University of Bremen who runs a thermodynamics lab, Johannes Kiefer. And so he had all these images and videos um, of uh, flames. And so for his research, what he wanted to know is the so-called flame front, which is the boundary between what's burning and what's not burning. And understand the location and the curvature of the flame front was critical to better understand turbulence and verify computer simulations. OK, so here is my <laughs> one layer. It's not really a neural layer. But yeah, anyways, it's smartly chosen linear thing um, with some nonlinear thing mixed in. Um, don't, I don't want to, like, I can give an entire hour long talk on this algorithm. I don't want to do that. I just want to say that somehow we're using these things called shearlets. We're taking in our products. We do something nonlinear to it. And it allows us to extract this local information. So here, this is one of his videos. Um, and we've got the flame front. And then we have the predicted curvature. Um, and this is, we can kind of change up the math a little bit and do blob detection. So this was from a, um, a Petri dish database. Um, and so we, we can figure out where the blobs are and what their diameters are that was like really good in particular when it handled with, for webcam images that had a lot of noise. And I will make a comment. <laughs> There's no way this is anywhere as fast as what was in Eric's talk. So I'm not trying to propose this is the way to go about it. But I'm just kind of pointing out something can happen. OK. So um, now let's move on to in painting using shearlets. And I didn't have another mention of Colin. So what I decided to do <laughs> was uh, um, let him brag on himself, so awarded the Burton Medal from the Microscopy Society of America. Um, but there is this, this annoying thing back when I used to work in in-painting where like a standard thing to do was just take an image and type on it. So whenever I would give an in-painting talk, I would just take an image related to the conference or the person who invited me and just type on it and say, don't you hate it when someone writes on your pictures? Because <laughs> it's just like <laughs> just the most obnoxious thing to, to be in-painting. Um, but yeah, so we have some image, we have some data, we're missing data, we want to fill it in. And you know, we saw in the first talk of this, um, this conference at Nigel's talk, you, know, you have completion of microscopy data, something of interest, or the filling in of webcam videos of your grad student, for some reason that's of interest. Um, right. Or you know, the erasure of people from history who got in your way. That's another really, really important uh, application of in painting. OK. So the key idea here, and again, I'm not pressuring this as being the right algorithm. I'm just like you know, tying in some of my old research. OK. Um, but this does kind of connect to Nigel's talk. It was still not 100% clear because I missed half of it doing teaching. But the key idea for the approach that I had worked on was we've got these two nice dictionaries that are incoherent to each other, but coherent to different desired structures in the data. So what we would choose is something like shearlets, which are good for like big geometric structure and something like discrete cosine basis that's good for texture. And they're incoherent to each other, but they're picking up like the cartoon-like and the texture-like parts of the images. And then we're leveraging that to do in-painting. And so we're solving some inverse problem. And um, actually, this is even exactly solved. It was non-constrained, and there's TV normalization going on. But it is still like leveraging this general idea of sparsely regularization being uh, powerful that we saw in Brian's talk. OK. So first, I want to say like really high degraded things is actually pretty easy. And I, I, so this was like not a, like, OK. Anyways, this was just an MS thesis from the group and just kind of dumped it in. And you can get this SSIM is a pretty good measure for um, perceptual similarity of images. It's pretty high. Unfortunately, the quality of the image that I took um, from her thesis, because it was just like cropped it out. I didn't have, for some reason, the original data from her. But it's, this was not like super like hard to do to get pretty good filling in when and things are, are gone. And Juan Carlos had to leave, but he was like so excited when he saw that level of degradation. And I'm like, that. Ah. I told him, I was like, that's actually easier. To me, the fact that he was doing it real time is the interesting thing. Because the, the idea is when you don't have big gaps between what's missing, that's like almost any algorithm will do kind of OK in painting. But let's look at some gaps. And the reason I want to do this 
Um, I, I'm not going to show an algorithm that's great, but I, it's just kind of related to this conversation um, that we were having about what is right and what is not right. So I, I have a mystery image here of some coral, and I've masked it out, and I used, this is back from 2013, just me to, uh, tooling around, so pre like having generative in-painting sort of neural networks to play with, um, these are just some standard approaches from back then. And um, yeah, so these two look a lot better than this one. This is actually not quite as sophisticated as the technique from the previous slide, but um, this looks all scratchy. Okay. Um, and then we see the original image. And here's what I want to do is we're going to zoom in. And we see these were the ones that were the better ones, but they have created completely different structure than what's happened. It's like they're really sure. And we ha with neural networks, it's even worse. Like they're going to power through and they're going to make a picture that looks really good. But the structure, which this kind of structure seems to me like the kind of structure that this audience might care about. And this thing looks really good. But then like this hump here is gone. That's now a channel. Um, there's just all of these different things like that little piece, that connector there is gone. Whereas this one is blurry, but somehow it didn't add new, um, any new structure. It's like less certain, but like, you know. Here's another example. This is from, um, oh my gosh, seismic uh, sensor data. Um, we just kind of did some vertical line masking. And again, you zoom into the original and you look at these that look a little bit better. And like here, this blue line is consistent. And now suddenly it's broken by this red blob. Um, so kind of just tying into that discussion after the talk, like what is real? So neural networks can give us stuff that looks good, but maybe, maybe that's not exactly the way we want to go. OK. Um, so uh, the last little y'all science question mark thing is geometry of adversarial attacks. This is also kind of like, how, how well can we trust neural networks? OK, so images input to neural networks performing classification tasks may be slightly perturbed to cause a network to strongly misclassify them. So this is kind of related to the discussion after Hoyland's talk. So if you think about it, if we train a neural network, we're using it, uh, we're training it on some images that are in some data class that if we could classify easily mathematically, we would, that, but we can't. That's why we're putting it to a neural network. But it is defining a function on all the possible inputs of the same size as your data. And so you don't really often need to move that far away from real data in order to completely throw this thing off because the nature of the kind of functions that are learned by networks. So I'm going to start with a very classical, if you've seen adversarial data, you've seen this picture from uh, Goodfellow, Flynn, and Segety in 2015. Oops. So what we have here is we have a panda. And the neural network originally, so this is from GoogleNet, um, which is not really the cutting edge anymore, but it only had 57.7% confidence that that's a panda. And then we add this noise, which it has low confidence as a nematode. And what we get is a gibbon with 99.3% confidence. So it's not only changed the class, it is, it is way more confident than it's the wrong class than it was that it was the right class. And this is... I mean, part of it, these, these pictures were a lot more <laughs> lower quality. So at this point, it's such low quality, I can't, I, I can't even tell the difference these two. OK, so this is from a more recent paper that, um, series of papers. And actually, this is why my research and I have been, like colleagues and I have been working on understanding this. It's called DamageNet. Um, so this one right here, I'm putting hair in my microphone. OK, this one right here was, was um, designed using what, knowing what the neural network was. This is a black box adversarial attack algorithm. So it was not designed or trained with knowledge in the neural network. I mean, the neural networks are out there in the public, but that was not in the training. They kind of, they, they use this, uh, this is a tension mechanism. Um, so there are certain ways that neural networks learn things that are just a consistent type of thing. So they make like a proxy neural network and train adversarially on that. Because a lot of networks now have like prevention from people giving it too much data at once to try to prevent people from being able to train adversarially. You make this proxy network that's built using things that seem to be a uniform way that neural networks learn. Then you go back. And so these five 
VGG, Inception, Inception ResNet, ResNet, Exception. There's like different numbers for different ones. These are like pretty state of the art neural networks trained to classify this ImageNet database uh, things. And so here we, on the left, we have this salamander, and all of them correctly identify it as a salamander. And then on the right, all of them are changed. So three of them think it's a bonnet, like a head covering. We got velvet, like the fabric, and then we got a stole, like the wrap around your shoulders, right? So all of them are tricked. I don't, it doesn't, the paper in this doesn't have like the numbers, like the certainty, but the point, the more uh, amazing thing is that every single one of these were tricked and it wasn't trained on any of those networks. So, um, just an interest of mine right now is in leveraging manifold and polyhedral geometry and graph theory to better understand the success of adversarial attacks and maybe protect against them. So this is, uh, we ordered the PIs alphabetically and then there'll be various permutations of the grad students and postdoc. Um, we've got one that's ready, but want do someone's funding, we have to wait to post it, and then more on the way. Okay. So I think I only have a few more minutes. Um, okay, you know, I'm just gonna like start, I'm not even gonna tell you the application, even though I think it's cool. You can ask me about it later. But um, I think it's just a fun little algorithm that some of you might be familiar with already. Um, okay, so let's say we have some data set. Then maybe it's one blob, maybe it's a union of disjoint blobs. Then what are the best points to, to represent the single data set, or in this point case, say, like these distinct blobs? Um, and how sensitive should that be to outliers? Okay, so prototypes of data classes in Euclidean space often solve this optimization problem. So we have our points in our space Xi, we subtract off our point Y, that's the thing we're trying to optimize, and we take some pth power of a two norm, and we add all those pth powers of two norms up, and we're gonna optimize that over Y restricted to some set A. So when A is just all of Euclidean space and P is two, this Y, this, the optimizer is known as centroid. And here's the crazy thing. I mean, it's at least squares problems so we know there's a closed form solution, but the closed form solution of this is quite nice. Does anyone know what it is? You just average the components. You take your data, you average the components, and that's gonna be the solution there. So least squares is always nice. This is particularly nice. Okay. Um, if we let R, A be all of Euclidean space, but now we're gonna raise these P norms to the first power, that's what's known as the geometric median. And if we restrict to our data set, but we're still only raising the first power, that's what's known as the P uh, metered. And obviously the P equals one things are somehow, they're, we're using the words median, metoid, suggestively because it means they're gonna be more robust to outliers. So if we have points that are further out, these things are gonna be a little more robust. And so P equals two is a closed form solution, and P equals one is less sensitive to outliers. Um, so I'm just gonna end with the Weitzfeld algorithm, which is not what my research is about, but I just think it's a fun uh, idea. So, key ideas. Finding centroids is easy. I know how to average things. Um, it, more generally, I know how to solve least squares. Um, other key idea, this, is, this might not be immediately obvious, but it is actually true that whatever the solution y to the geometric median problem is, it satisfies this equation. Now we can't solve for y here, y is mixed in in all these different places, but it does satisfy this equation. So we're gonna use these, leverage these two things. So given our data set, we're gonna compute this till it's converged. We're going to solve a weighted uh, least squares problem, which in this case, our least squares problem is just taking the component y's average. And, but instead of taking the component-wise average of the vectors, we're gonna take them of weighted versions of themselves, and these weights that we get are just coming from this very classical technique that if you have some implicit function involving what you're trying to optimize to, you just use the right-hand side of that function to give you your next iterative step. And so you do this, um, and then, you know, when you're lucky, it converges to this median. And such algorithms are called iteratively uh, reweighted least squares, IRLS, which um, Sandra briefly mentioned on one slide in the middle as like a technique that was being used to solve a problem that she had. And this is you know, from 30, 37. Um, and now I think I've reached uh, my time limit, so I'll just say, you can do this cool thing with like 
subspaces, so not points, but actual full subspaces, um, generalize these things. Um, the, in this case, the least squares thing involves a principal component analysis of some special matrix. And then we make a, a median version. And cool things happen. We can do some things in computer vision. Um, so I'm going to finish this up by saying um, reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. This is a little PCA here. And thanks for your time and the trypophobia I have now from seeing all these quasi-periodic pictures of the last couple of days. Thank <laughs> you.